My name's Polly Russell. I'm the head of the Eccles Centre for American Studies at the British Library. The Eccles Centre supports scholarship and learning about the Americas using the British Library's fantastic collections. One of the main programmes that we run in collaboration with Hay Festivals is the Eccles Hay Writers Award. Now, this funds two writers every year for an unpublished book focused on some aspect of the Americas <coughs> which could use research in the British Library. Over the years, we have welcomed some fantastic writers, but none more fantastic than Sarah Churchwell and Philip Clark, uh, who <laughs> were the winners in 2015. <laughs> and 2022, so I am just thrilled that they're in conversation together. They're going to be talking together for about an hour and then we're going to open up to the audience. So please save your burning questions about Trump, about what is happening with the Supreme Court, what the hell is happening in America, for Sarah, who will be all ready to answer. Um, Sarah will also be signing books afterwards. I don't know how many, how many of you here have read the book or have the book? Steve, show of hands. Okay, so some of you can all attest to how it is absolutely <laughs> riveting. It is a, it really is an absolute essential read for anyone interested in contemporary culture and America. It's wonderful. So it's in paperback now. I think it's 10.99. Do buy a copy. So Phil is going to introduce um, Sarah, but I want to say a few words about Phil. I've now known Phil for just over a year, and it has been a total delight getting to know him. He has got the most infectious insatiable curiosity which he puts to tremendous use rooting around in the British Library's collections to inform the book that he won the Writers Award for, The Sound of the City, an exploration of what New York sounds like. So I'm so desperate for this book to be written I was tempted to not let him do this tonight because this is taking time away from him finishing that book. Um, he has written for more problems. magazines than I can possibly list and he's the author of a critically acclaimed and highly original biography of the jazz musician David Brubeck, which explores Brubeck's creativity as both the product of individual genius and also the cultural context of the United States. So he is therefore the absolutely perfect, perfect person to be in conversation with Sarah about American politics, culture and life. So over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, um, I'm a music writer, and this gig is a slightly outside of my normal area. But I have to say, I'm now into my a second a book a dealing with an American a subject, and your a books are foundational texts as I sort of explore the issues. I mean, you can't write about a music in America and not deal with the sort of issues mm. that your books do. But um, I think, I mean, I, I've always been aware of Sarah's work, but I think uh, the, the thing that... Uh, I sort of clinched um, your sort of uh, role in, in, in my life I was when uh, you kneecapped uh, Piers Morgan on a Twitter <laughs> <laughs> after he was after he was incredibly my rude proudest about moment. You. Yeah, yeah. And hello, Piers, if you if, if you're watching the live stream, um, so that was you know, the moment I thought, right, I have to take this lady uh, seriously. And you've written a biography of uh, Marilyn. Monroe, there's a fine a book about F. Scott Fitzgerald and the whole, you know, sort of ramifications of the great uh, Gatsby. And some jazz in that. And some jazz in that, indeed, indeed. I'll defer to you, but there is a little jazz <laughs> in that. There is a little jazz in that, as there would be in a book about F. Scott. Better be, yeah. Yeah. And then um, there is, a, a, the book after that is a, a Behold America, which begins with one Fred a, a Trump up to no good in the far right. Um, I mean, know where that ends. And then... This uh, current book, I mean, I wouldn't like to say, uh, well, I wouldn't uh, presume to say it's a sequel to Behold America, but it's certainly, I would say, a companion, a volume. Would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely. A follow-up or even a sibling. Yes, sort a sibling. Of how I think about it. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, you know. And it seems to me, you know. well stepbrother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, reading the book, it seems to, uh, to me it would have been more trouble uh, for you not to have written uh, that book. It's written with such, you know, it sort of takes no uh, prisoners. It sort of punches from the gut. Oh, and well, I wonder if you could explain, it, you know, a little bit about how this idea of, you know, sort of hobscotching, you know, around history, I use him sort of gone with the wind as a, as, as a kind of two-way mirror into the past, mm -hmm. in, into the present, and perhaps even taking a punt on the future. I mean, if mm. you could explain how that sort of uh, uh, clarified itself in your, in your mind. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, I've never thought of it as a two-way mirror, but that's a really nice image. I wish mm. I'd thought of it, and I would have put it in the book. Um, it's yours. 
it, it's it's no, it's 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 exactly right, and um, and it was and it's a hard. It has been a hard thing to kind of try to describe what I what mm. I thought Gone with the Wind could do. Um, so the the way it came about really was that, um, and it actually Polly kind of alluded to it in um, in her kind introduction that people and I and I say this at the beginning of the book because it's literally true. Um, people kept saying to me, what the hell is going on in America? And they mm. still do, like every day, like what's happening and what's going to happen and mm. what do you think about the elections and what's going to happen? And, um, but, but particularly when Trump got elected, you know, everybody was just so thrown. Mm. Um, and, and obviously I say that as a generalization and people will say, well, I wasn't thrown or I knew or I was reading the right things or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how many people predicted accurately in that moment that Trump was going to win, and certainly mm. some people did, it still overthrew a lot of certainties, uh, supposed certainties, mm. about what we thought the United States, the direction of travel that we mm. thought the United States was on. And, um, and so, yeah, I've written these, basically these two books. As you say, they do work together mm. um, to try to understand that myself, to try to, to explain it to other people if I could, to try to, to take w what I know and to see if I could contribute to some project of of rebuilding what I see as a um, uh, as a as a I mean I don't want to get grandiose to start with I feel like I should build up to that um, <laughs> but but what I see as as a as a as a democratic project you know certainly under threat mm. um, if not imploding in various parts of the world and um, and so I think that for for everybody who feels that way. We had to figure out kind of what our contribution could be, and not everybody can run for public office, and not everybody, I mean, I would be dreadful in elected office, but I know how to write books, you mm. know? And so it was like, and I know how to research, and I know stuff about America, and I understand certain things about this, and I intuitively understood some stuff, and I knew stuff, other stuff from, you know, studying it. And I've been teaching Gone with the Wind for years, years and years and years, teaching it as, a, as part of a course on the history of American popular fiction. Um, and that began, some of you will be fans of Backlisted. I'm going to do a shout out to Backlisted, the podcast. For those of you who aren't, you should be. Um, absolutely wonderful podcast about kind of neglected books and bringing them back up. Um, and I just did um, a special episode last week, and I, and I brought up the first American bestseller, which is from 1791 called Charlotte Temple. And people don't know it, and it's really interesting. And, and there's a whole story there to be told about American popular culture and American popular stories. So I always understood Gone with the Wind in that context, and I... You know, and when you teach a story, you teach a book, you 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 learn it from the inside out mm. in different ways. Mm. And so it was always kind of in my head, and I loved it as a kid, so it was in my head for those reasons. So it was always there as a reference point, and then all of this stuff started happening around statues and the with you know Trump in 2017 around taking down the the you know there were the protests in in August of that year about taking down the statue of Robert E. Lee, and then Heather Heyer was killed, and that, of course, was the famous incident where... In Charlottesville. In Charlottesville, where Trump said that there were very fine people on both sides, mm -hmm. even though one side was entirely white supremacist. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I, was in, I was having conversations with people then about the lost cause and about the history of the Civil War, mm -hmm. and, and just gradually realizing that Gone with the Wind was always the reference point. It was always the touch point when you had this whole complicated history that you had to try to tell, and then you would say, well, it's basically, you know, the world have gone with the wind. Mm. And even uh, Trump at one, I mean, he, yeah, even he times. raised it as a film which, you know, American filmmakers must aspire to make again. Exactly. So when, yeah. and it was specifically when, when uh, um, Parasite won uh, yeah. Best Picture, mm. when a North, uh, sorry, North Korean, it was not a North Korean film, obviously, sorry. <laughs> uh, that would have been interesting. But it was a South Korean film, and obviously the first, you know, one to win Best Picture. Mm. So what happens when he has a foreign language Asian film win Best Picture, and what film does he say that he wished would win, but Gone with the Wind, mm. right? It was either that or Birth of the Nation. It was right? sort, of, sort of, you know, either sort of double-edged. Yeah. Um, and so, and it was that same, it was, well, within a year anyway, that um, when um, the Black Lives Matter protests erupted around the murder of George Floyd, mm. Um, and HBO, stream, HBO Max announced that it would remove Gone with the Wind from mm. its streaming service temporarily just to contextualize it. Mm. And, and in my view, cynically and disingenuously, the right-wing press went mad saying that it was censorship. Mm. And it wasn't censorship. They were just adding stuff to mm. it. It's mm. not censorship. Mm. Um, that's annotation. It's an mm. old scholarly practice, you know. And, um, and so it, it kept being this lightning rod. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's not just a lightning rod. It's being used in, in this very gestural way. Mm. But the more you 
delve into it, the more you think about it, the more it actually reveals. But it would be interesting to know how many people have seen at, at the film. How many people have seen? Yeah, almost the, everybody. Almost everyone. And how many people have read uh, the book? I mean the Gone with the Wind book. Not, yeah, yeah. yeah, not my book. A Gone with the Wind. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, and I mean, can, can I ask one sure, other question? Sure. For out of those of you who have neither seen it nor read it, how many of you have never heard of it? <laughs> right? Because it remains this touch point. So it's still in our culture. And so mm. that's what it's, it's, it's incredibly influential and it shapes people's thinking whether they're aware of it or not. And that was part of what I wanted to get. I mean, I mean, I only saw the film, I have to confess, after I read your book. Or, it's not a confession. Or, <laughs> or I consciously saw the film yeah. after I read your book, but actually when I sat down and watched it, I, I realized I sort of knew it anyway. Mm. And perhaps I did see it as a, as a kid on my mum's lap mm. or, or whatever. But it's, I mean, just the, um, the images and the phraseology, I, you know, I played arrangements of the, of, of the music when I was a kid in brass bands and stuff. Yeah, exactly, and it's exactly. Just, and it's it, our lingua franca, right? Yeah, and it's, it's impossible. Just, it's but I mean, you grew up in, in Chicago, in is that Chicago, right? Yeah. In the 1970s, 80s? 80s, thank yeah, 80s, sorry, you. Sorry, <laughs> well, I was sorry, alive early. in the 70s, let's be honest. Yes. <laughs> but, I mean, is, but I mean, is it a part, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not American, so, but I mean, is it a part of, you know, every, every American, uh, of my generation, yeah. I would say so, yeah. So it first came to free television in America in 77. Right. Um, and um, up until that point, it had been like in revival in cinemas and that right. sort of thing. So, um, and but from 77, it was on every year on TV, a bit like the British Great Escape at Christmas. I thought Christmas you know, special. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, it wasn't at Christmas, but it was, it was on every year and you could... Mm. Um, and um, and I so it was this kind of spectacle that you would gather around and everybody at least with the family my generation would watch with the families yeah. yeah and I absorbed a lot of information about the Civil War from that story first it was because I was what seven or eight or whatever mm. and so it was you know that was when I first remember thinking about I knew there was this thing the Civil War but I hadn't even studied it in school yet I mean mm. even you know at the level that you do it at you know mm. at year eight or whatever mm. you uh, you don't you don't or your, whatever it is. I can never do the translations either. What we call third grade when you're eight is what I'm talking about. Um, and um, so even at that age, you're not, being, you're not yet studying the Civil War, mm. you know? So I absorbed a lot of Gone with the Wind. And the way that Gone with the Wind presents itself is that y you think it's a, um, it's, a, it's a story about fictional characters, obviously, but that it's against a realistic background. Mm. So you think the stuff around the war is realistic, and then it's the characters who are fictionalized. But actually, the stuff around the war is totally not realistic. But, ev but so many Americans have absorbed that as basically accurate. And, and I guess when you're sort of eight, you know, eight and, and nine, it's very seductive, the, you know, the sort of costumes and the- Sure was and for the, me, and the hoop skirts, and oh my God, I loved the dresses. What are hoop skirts, just, sorry? Hoop skirts are the big crinolines oh, that, right. the, that the women wear. I was obsessed with them. Really? Oh yeah, no, totally. Yeah. And I would like, I would dress my Barbie dolls like Scarlet. Like I just, I was, and I, I also, I mean, I had, I had a bit about this in the prologue that I cut, um, but I probably, it keeps coming up in talks, so I probably should have just left it in the book. But um, <laughs> I, um, no, but this is true. I, I, when I was around nine or 10, I was like, obsessed with Gone with the Wind. And I, and I would lay awake every night replaying Rhett leaving Scarlet in my head and work out stories of reconciliation. And well, I, so I was a child of divorce and it did occur to me later that possibly I was triggered by the man walking out of the house and maybe that has something to do with it. But like, but I, but, it, but it was, it's, I mean, it's, I really was like every night. Um, I, I, it, it, it did something to me and I identified incredibly strongly with Scarlett. But it's extraordinary that, um, you know, I mean, we're talking sort of 15 years after 1968 and the civil rights mm. movement and, and yet, uh, uh, you know the sort of you know the sort of uh, the sort of dark sort of underbelly of that film hadn't sort of no, permeated. No, it. not at all. It was a, a you know my my experience of growing up in the suburbs of Chicago in a very affluent white part of America was that I mean I went to high school with four thousand students. In my graduating class, there were a thousand students, mm. and I, I literally think it is true to say that there were about half a dozen African American wow. students. Um, uh, and we were streamed because it was so big. So you know when they would you know separate you by level, mm. um, and um, and literally in my classes there were two African American students, um, one of whom went on to become a professor at Stanford and to advise Obama. Wow. Um, and 
and looks a lot like Obama, actually, and we've stayed, we've stayed good friends. And, um, and so there were you know, some really, really outstanding, spectacular people, and I've talked to him a lot about what it was like to be you know, um, literally like the only black person you know, in, in that school. And, but I was oblivious to it because I was totally insulated from it. But Chicago was one of the most sort of segregated cities you know, in terms of you know, sort of you know, putting a dividing line to, during the population, you know, to keep the black a part of the city away, you know, from obviously the sort of city, yeah. the city well, and, and union. And it's something I talk about in the book, right, is that one of the after effects of slavery is that, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do in the book really is to, is to go back to origins, you can never get back to real origins, mm. obviously, what's the starting point, but to try to understand some of the origins of where we are and the ways in which Gone with the Wind can encapsulate some of that. And, and segregation is a really good example, right? Mm. So you grow up in America, you grow up with the reality of segregation that comes out of the Jim Crow laws. But in the North, you think, well, that doesn't really apply to us. Mm. But it did, A, because there were Jim Crow laws in the North, as you all well know as a student of jazz, sure. it's all over. Yeah. Um, uh, the color bar was you know, defining the cotton club. And I mean, a lot of people don't know this, right? but just give one example, which you'll be extremely familiar with. But the famous cotton club in Harlem, a lot of people don't realize, was a segregated club, and it only catered to white customers. And it had black entertainers, and it had black staff, but black customers could not come to the cotton club. And so this kind of fantasy that we have about the cotton club is this mixed race Mm. You know, it's just nonsense. And right? those black entertainers included geniuses like uh, Drew Gallington, who was... Exactly, but could not have paid to have a table at the yeah. Cotton Club, right? They would not have served him at the yeah. Cotton Club. Yeah. Um, and, of course, this comes into the story of Gone with the Wind yeah. when, um, when Hattie McDaniel became the first African-American yeah. yeah. to win an Oscar for her portrayal of Mammy in the film of Gone with the Wind and almost wasn't able to attend the ceremony in Los Angeles because it was at a segregated venue in 19, the early 1940. And David Selznick, the producer, had to pull strings to get her into the club. And then the club owner insisted that she sit at a table separately from the white cast. So it was set in LA, right, in 1940. So when I was growing up, there was this reality of, there was that kind of political, what I might describe now as political racial segregation. Mm. But there was also this reality of socioeconomic segregation. Mm. And we turned an absolute blind eye to that. And that was what I grew up in. I grew up in this very affluent area, and black people didn't live there because they couldn't afford it. Mm. So I, as a child in particular, kind of unthinkingly saw that as, I mean, I wouldn't have ever described it as meritocratic, but I just kind of assumed that you know, the people who had done well had done well, and the people who hadn't done well hadn't done well, and I didn't think about causes, and I didn't think about structure, certainly didn't think about inequality in any of that. And this was during the sort of Carter era, I guess. Um, Reagan, sort of, uh, this early is Reagan. Reagan. <laughs> early Reagan, sorry, I keep... Emily Reagan. Oh, <laughs> um, no, no, I mean that in terms of the politics of it. Yeah, but yeah, I'm not, being, yeah, I'm not yeah. being particular about my age there, but no, but that's a very <laughs> Reagan-esque, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, Reaganite kind of way of looking at America. And, um, and then, so part of what I'm trying to do in the book is actually to look back at the ways in which all of that actually has these root causes in slavery. So what happened, I think this is something Americans don't talk about, at least in my experience, we don't talk about it. But um, certainly not in general, you know, again, not, not something I learned in school. Mm. Um, so we learned that Lincoln emancipated the slaves in 1863. We learned that the, um, you know, the um, 13th Amendment was passed in 1865. We learned that stuff. What we don't learn is that after four million slaves were emancipated, the, all of the white United States washed their hands of the freed people and said, great, our job is done. Like, mm. we've done our bit. And so there was absolutely no, no effort to, uh, there was a little bit of effort, but I mean no concerted federal effort. There were patchy efforts that gradually imploded um, to create educational opportunities, to create any kind of um, employment opportunities, to give <coughs> land. There were promises to give land that were reneged on the famous promise of 40 acres and a mule, mm, mm. Um, which was completely reneged on by the government. Um, so basically what you do is you emancipate four million people who have literally no skills, who have been kept without skills for generations, um, you know, deliberately so. You don't give them any money, you don't give them any land, you don't give them any education, you don't give them any job opportunities, you don't give them clothes, clothes or food, um, and then you say, right, you're on your own. And where's that gonna, yeah. And, th and then where do they end up? They end up in slums. They end up in uh, um, shanty towns. They end up in shanty towns that white landowners leased to them, or mm. you know, sold mm. to them, leased to them, um, in the bottoms that they didn't want to live on when the white landowners were living on highland, which then became known as like Black Bottom. Mm. And then they would say things like, oh, well, black people like to live in 
the bottoms, mm. um, you know, in the floodplains and whatever. And and that and, and Gone with the Wind has whole sections about this, about the mm. about the dirty black vagrants who are living mm. in these mm. terrible mm. shanty towns. Mm. Well, that's all the land they could get. Mm. You know? So I mean, effectively, they were—I mean, they were sort of, uh, they were sort of enslaved again. Well, and, th and those those areas turned into the segregated areas mm. in Atlanta today, mm. in mm. eventually in Chicago mm. today, as they moved north. Mm. The, the areas that they were allowed to live in then became redlined. Mm. Then it became legalized, and by the time you get to Nixon and to Reagan, that's all been completely. It's all been built in. And and the root causes have sort of been. Uh, there's a collective. Uh, Amnesia about it. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can we talk a little bit about Margaret Mitchell? Must we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, she. Yeah, she she does feature. She did write of, the book. It's sort of her fault we're yeah, here. Yeah, really. yeah, absolutely. But I mean, she seems. Um, yeah, I mean, she seems. You know, I, I mean, quite an extraordinary a, a figure in in all sorts of ways, and not all of them are good. But I mean, do you think? Um, I mean, the fact she was a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, what role you know did that uh, 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 play in the book as it? As it appeared, because after you know, after the Civil War, there's, there's this thing, you know, that women, the only thing you know they could own in inverted commas, mm -hmm. were people. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a taken away after the Civil yeah. War. And um, I mean, what impact you know, you know, that have on her, on her mindset as mm -hmm. she was writing the book. Well, I'm really glad you asked that because it was one of the things that I didn't understand properly when I started researching the book, and I was really interested in the relationship between white feminism in America, oh. historically, and um, anti-black racism, mm. and how they and how that all played out in reality. Again, not in the stories that we tell, but actually in as much as we can try to understand documentary history, you know, what, what can, how can we see this? And there's this really, um, to me, uh, very um, under, I was gonna say under understood, which I really shouldn't say, mm. um, but because uh, um, it's not misunderstood, it's, it's it's not even neglected. It's just kind of not out there. Mm. Um, uh, um, part of the story around the way in which the debates about whether women would get the vote, which were in, is in, in the United States, is the Nineteenth Amendment. Um, so this is after the Civil War. After the Civil yeah, War. Yeah. So the debates about the Nineteenth Amendment, about whether all women would get the vote, retroactively in in the South, were always debates about whether the Fifteenth Amendment which gave black men the vote after the Civil War, but had been ignored for 50, willfully, and, mm. and not just ignored, had been uh, uh, um, uh, kind of denied and suppressed for 50 years. There was this whole debate where white Southern political leaders, all men by definition, because women couldn't vote or hold office at that point, said, if you give women the vote, it will retroactively undo our suppression of the 15th Amendment, which mm. gave black men the vote because mm. we have successfully suppressed them from voting. Mm. And they said this explicitly. They said this in so many words, it's very easy to find. And they said it over and over again. They said it in speeches. And what they said was, so, so they, they had this whole debate about whether women should get the vote around the question of what that would do to white supremacism. And would women getting the vote, and I say women, because it was a universal vote, black and white women, so they would have these numerical trade-offs. And they would say, well, if, if do the number of black women outweigh the number of white women, and then can we like be sure that white supremacism will be upheld if we, and it's their phrase, white supremacism, mm. right? And they're so, quite open about it. They very conscious yeah. and explicit. Yeah. That's what it was about. And that story is not well known enough, um, as I say, but it follows on to your question. It follows on from another <coughs> misunderstanding about the way American slavery worked. So that we talk about 19th century uh, white women, and this is a, this is certainly how I learned um, the the kind of history of slavery, even as a graduate student um, in the in the 90s, was that the um, was that in the slave system there was this kind of clear hierarchy, in which um, uh, black women were at the bottom of the hierarchy, black men were marginally higher because of patriarchy, um, then white women were the next step up, and white men had all the power, right? And I think that's a pretty commonplace mm. view. Um, but it's not right, and it is um, recent women uh, historians of color who have brought this to light, and this is all in the last five, six years, um, a couple of really remarkable books, um, showing that actually white women in the South were able to hold, they couldn't hold any property in the same way that women in 19th century Britain couldn't hold property, couldn't hold land, couldn't have bank accounts, had no legal rights all under the system of what was called coverture, same thing in the US, except 
when it came to chattel slavery. And white women could hold chattel slaves. And they could bequeath chattel slaves. And they could sell chattel slaves. And they could trade them. And they could control them. It was the one kind of property that they could own. And it the, was the great exception. And presumably that was because well, that got the men off the hook having to do with the slaves. That no, I think that <laughs> it, it, no, it, it doubled their ability to own slaves. So it, it, right. it just embedded power across, white right. power across the system. Mm. So men were basically willing to relinquish total control to mm. make sure that they were willing to relinquish a little bit of gender control to ensure that they had total racial control. I see, I see. So it just embedded white supremacy that mm. much further, right? Mm. So you say, okay, this is the one exception we'll make. Women can control black people mm. in this way. Mm. Um, and so that meant that in real terms, at the end of the Civil War, white women in the South were in many ways more aggrieved and more bitter. Mm. Because they had they had more to lose mm. because they couldn't reclaim their property in other ways. Yeah. Um, whereas white men could lose their human property, mm. but then reclaim land money in other mm. ways. Um, yeah. And women couldn't. And that's very much the story of Gone with the Wind. It's very much the story of how Scarlett O'Hara is going to rebuild her fortune after it has been unfairly ripped away from her by the Yankees. And Margaret Mitchell, to answer this is a very roundabout way of answering a question, but I think it's important. But the um, so Margaret Mitchell based Scarlett O'Hara on her own grandmother and on her experiences of the Civil War. And so Margaret Mitchell grew up listening to a Scarlett O'Hara type character tell these stories of aggrieved loss about this wonderful life that she had lived and how it had all been stolen from her by the Yankees and how she was determined to get it back. And she had this great avarice for land, which was, you know, remarked upon even more or less at the time. And and you know, one of um, Mitchell's biographers talks about the fact that the Mitchell family, which was a wealthy family, she came from an elite background, and that they had rebuilt their, um, you know, their wealth after the war. And then he says most of their money was from property. And I'm like, well, I mean, you might want to stop and comment upon the fact that that was actually how the um, the the white elite in the South ha hung on to their power mm. after the war because they didn't lose their land. And really, that's what Gone with the Wind, as I say, is about. It, it purports to be a romance with between Scarlet and Rhett, or between Scarlet and Ashley, but it's really a romance between Scarlet and the land. It's about land and property, essentially. That's what it's about. Love of land and property. Absolutely. And therefore, money. Money, yeah. And what, um, um, I mean, Mitchell, as a, I mean, how would you rate Mitchell, I mean, if you, if you take all the sort of politics out of it, uh, just for a second, mm. I mean, how do you rate her as, as a writer, as a, as a sort of, you know, the sort of craft? I, that, I yeah. mean, is it, is it, um, is it well written? Is it, I mm. mean, do you admire, you know, that aspect of it or? I think there are a lot, of, there are a lot of things to admire about Gone with the Wind if you can put the yeah. racial politics to one side, as I mean, you just, say. I mean, just for, just for a second. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, what I've learned to say about it and the way I used to teach it was I did do that thing of saying, well, it's racist, but. And now I think we have to say, well, it's racist and. Yeah. Um, but there are other things about it mm. um, in addition to its racism. And um, she was certainly a craftsperson, right? I mean, she, she trained as a journalist. She knew how to write. Um, she was a stringer for what, for, for local newspaper. Atlanta right? Journal, yeah, yeah. for yeah. many years. And, um, and, you know, and she knew how to write. Mm. And um, I, so in terms of its craftsmanship, mm. I will, um, I will defer to F. Scott Fitzgerald, mm. who worked on the film version mm. and read the novel and wrote a couple of letters about the novel mm. and said he was surprised at how well put together it was. Mm. Um, he f said he felt nothing but a kind of pity for people who thought it was the greatest literary art that humankind could produce. Mm. Um, but that, he said, but for what it is, it's very well put together. Mm. And, and, he th and he actually was, he, admi he admired it more than he expected to. And I think that's a fair assessment of it. The thing for me that I always think that people who haven't read it don't expect to find in it, and that I find it's kind of saving grace, mm. is that it's funny. And it's really? deliberately funny. Mm. Um, she's very acidic. Mm. Um, she has a really, really acidic sense of humor. And she's very cynical. Mm. It's a very cynical love story. Um, it ends in a very adult and kind of mordant way. Mm. Um, it's about love wearing out. I mean, it's not, it's not a childish story. Mm. And, um, and it's not sentimental in those ways at all. Um, and she's also very, very good on the white caste system. She just has these enormous blinkers on about race. Mm. Um, but within the world she understands and is willing to think about, mm. um, she's extremely good on, on white politics and the intricacies <coughs> of the white caste system um, in the, you know, among the, the differences between a, a, you know, a kind of yeoman farmer and, mm. a, and an elite slave mm. Mm. planter. And, oh, she's very good on all of that mm. stuff. So there, there are things there to admire. There are saving graces. There are. I mean, yeah. in my view, yeah. 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 And, and the feminism I've talked about. I mean, Scarlet is 
really interesting. Yes. Scarlett is the first uh, American every woman, right? She's, the, she's, she's very much a Becky Sharp character, for those who don't know the novel. She, and, and Mitchell modeled her on Becky Sharp to a great extent. Um, and, and she wanted it to be a kind of, uh, you know, Thackerayan or, you know, uh, um, Balzacian kind mm. of comedy men. I mean, I was going to ask what are sort of literary, I mean, sort of, I mean, I mean Dickens or... No, it's more, more it, it is more, it is more like Balzac or, mm. but uh, definitely Thackeray. I mean, so mm. she, I think she saw it as a kind of, um, as, an, as certainly an epic or, or even War and Peace, right? So it's an epic across war mm. about these individuals struggling against war mm. and then with this kind of sharp satirical aspect. Mm. Um, and she's, and I think she's very interested, interested in um, women's power and very interesting within limits on women's power. Her mother was a, um, a, a white suffragist in this, a white, obviously, sorry, but she was a, what I meant was she was a suffragist for white yeah. women in the South. And, um, and, she, and, and Mitchell always said that one of her earliest memories was sitting on stage, you know, with a votes for women sash mm, on her, mm. um, blowing kisses at the men in the audience. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and so she grew up within an explicitly feminist framework within their understanding of what feminism meant in the South at that point, yeah. which as I say was a white supremacist framework. But so for her, it's a feminist book. She set, to, she set out to write what we would describe as a feminist book. And Scarlett is an anti-heroine. Mm. She's, uh, she's riven with faults. And the novel's very clear about what those faults are. And, um, and, and, and that was... And that know, would be sort of selfishness and a self-obsession. Yeah, yeah. And, her, and her immorality. I mean, her mm. ruthlessness. Her, mm. So she's a, she's a survivalist. And mm. that's what people like about her. Mm. Um, and what they identify with, right? As her, mm. as for those of you who remember the movie, her, you know, as God is my witness, yeah. I'll never be hungry again. And she says, if I have to lie, cheat, steal, or kill, mm. as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. And she does have to lie, mm. cheat, mm. steal, and kill. Mm. And she does all of those things. Mm. And she saves herself and her family, and, but at great cost to herself. Mm. And she loses the only things that she actually wants. So, and it, did Mitchell see herself? I mean, was, uh, was there Scarlet, you know, sort of uh, like Mitchell, you know, sort of Mitchell's sort of alter ego or? Yeah, alter ego, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, as I say, she was based on her grandmother. So mm. I think that she had a certain kind of clarity about Scarlet that, mm. but certainly her, some of her own traits, I'm sure. Mm. And she, crept in. <laughs> but, um, and she was obsessed with erotica, Margaret Mitchell, and yeah. what she called uh, dirty books, is that? Yeah, she had a little, she had a little <laughs> porn fetish, <laughs> which, is, which is always a little surprising. And it seemed to have a sadistic, she had a kind of um, S&M thing, really? by all accounts. I haven't actually read the porn, but that's what the biographers say. What is it about these American so, people on the right? Well, let's not generalize. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, on the right, no, yeah, I'll accept yeah, that generalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, fair. Yeah. yeah, no, except to be fair to her, she was never anti-sex in that way. I mean, no. she, she actually wasn't. And so there's no squeamishness about sex in the novel. Mm. And um, uh, of course, she didn't do a lot of other writing, so we can't compare well, She it was there, killed but, um, before she was 50 in a car accident. Yeah, she was, yeah. She was run over by a drunk driver, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Um, mm. when she, yeah, at 49. Mm. So, um, so, I mean, to be fair to her, she didn't do that reactionary thing mm. of trying to be, she wasn't puritanical about sex. Mm. Uh, certainly not about other people's sex, sexual lives. Mm. Um, and um, if anything, you know, she saw herself, I mean, she certainly saw herself as a flapper in the 20s mm. and she shocked, you know, uh, um, scandalized Atlanta by, by dancing um, La Pache, mm. you know. Uh, so she was. Uh, so I, I think that she's not quite as bad as the. So I mean, she's I a mean, more. She was reactionary as hell, but mm. not about sex. And she's a more sort of nuanced there figure than uh, perhaps we think. Well, perhaps we would imagine. She's look, a more complex figure. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, most people who are smart enough to write a book that that you know has literally influenced people for almost a century mm. and that grabs people's imagination to the extent that it does. Yes, she was greatly helped by the film. Mm. Selznick did a great job of bringing that film to life and mm. so did the cast. Mm. Um, so she certainly had a, you know, amplification from that. Mm. But, um, but I always, you know, I always fall back on the, um, I, I don't believe that people trip and write masterpieces. Mm. Um, that's, I don't think Gone with the Wind is a masterpiece, but I always say that in regard to The Great Gatsby, for example, I mentioned Fitzgerald, and people do talk about Fitzgerald as this inspired amateur who like accidentally wrote The Great Gatsby, like you can't accidentally yeah. write The Great Gatsby, mm. right? And, and I also don't think you can accidentally write a thousand page novel that mm. grips millions and mm. millions and millions mm. of people around the world mm. for almost a century. Mm. So I think we have to give her the credit for what she mm. was good at. Mm. It's just that we also have to call out the problems in mm. it because they've been so influential. 
And can we talk about um, the distinction there between uh, the novel and the film? Yeah. And it seems, I mean, it seems interesting to sort of bring it back to, you know, bring it back to Trump that, you know, Trump is uh, considered, you know, to be the showbiz uh, president who, who ascended at, at the presidency through no political skill mm. whatsoever, no political experience. He was mm. a, you know, he was a sort of TV reality, uh, he, he, he was a, rea a reality a, a TV host who, who sort of used that as leverage mm. to become a, a president. And also, you know, a Gone with the Wind, um, it's essentially, uh, not to be sort of, uh, you know, sort of too Adorno-esque about it, but it's, it, it's the entertainment industry essentially are trying to do the civil war yeah. and realise an ouch, it's a bit sort of awkward. I mean, you know, there are certain things that we can't mention. Yeah. So in the film, in the, in the book, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the clan is mentioned, but in the film it becomes a kind of social uh, club as, yes. if they're, yeah. as if they're playing kind of chess and a exactly. ping-pong or whatever. Exactly. whatever. And the um, and, and the book is sort of riven with the N word. Yeah. And again, there was this big a, d a debate uh, as the film, you know, was being uh, produced about you know exactly how how to do that. And it's like you know, <coughs> and it's this sort of you know, it's this sort of American you know thing of you know everything. Well, not everything, you know, but things are being refracted uh, through the entertainment industry, and, mm. and they don't always uh, work. They can't always yeah. deal with yeah. you know kind of serious heavy issues that you know like the civil war and uh, and uh, yeah. racism. It's a it's a really good question, I think, and and there are lots of uh, of kind of aspects to that that I'd like to touch on. I mean, I think that the um, the degree to which American America wants to turn everything into entertainment hmm. um, is certainly um, a major issue right now. Uh, and you know, as you say, historically, but but we're really seeing it with Trumpian politics and hmm. not having to limit it to Trump. He taught, I think, a lot of. The, this generation of politics, how to do that, mm. uh, politicians, um, how to do that. But you know, if we look at the Dominion case right now, the, the I mean, many of you the were Fox following News. the Fox News yeah. um, lawsuit, and Fox News's uh, defense up until now has always been that the Sean Hannitys and the Tucker Carlsons could lie through their teeth because they weren't news, but they were entertainment. Mm. Now that they're being sued for defamation, they've stopped using that mm. excuse. And now they're saying that it was newsworthy so that they could cover lies, and they're just saying that they were covering them. Right? Mm. To me, what's, part of what's interesting in this is that nobody that I've seen yet has actually talked about that shift. Because until Dominion sued them, their defense was always, mm. everybody knows this is just the entertainment part of Fox News, it's not the news part of Fox mm. News, right? Mm. And Tucker Carlson would say things like, nobody sane would believe the things that I say. Mm. And then people would vote, you know, according mm. to the things mm. he said. And then Trump hijacked that attitude and realized that he could turn politics into a carnival mm. and uh, and and get free airtime, and and that's you know really how he did it. And, and, and hence all the kind of Disney sort of rallies and the yeah. and all the kind of the you know the uh, the stupid yeah act and the because the you have to pay for political airtime in America. You mm. have that's why it's so expensive. You have uh, to yeah. raise money to get television airtime. Mm. And then to do that, you have to get eyeballs. You had like the equivalent of clicks. You know, you have to do something controversial to get people to watch you. Mm. And Hillary Clinton standing up being reasonable was not interesting television. Mm. And Trump standing up and saying batshit crazy stuff mm. was interesting television. Mm. And so you have Les Moonves at CBS mm. saying he's very bad for America, but he's damn good for CBS. Mm. That's it's, what he said. It's good for ratings. It's good for ratings, yeah. right? And that's literally a quote, right? That's what he said. Mm. So the... Um, so I think that the but the the question about Gone with the Wind the film is is a slightly different one because it was a little bit less cynical. Mm. The the people making the film I think their their intentions were better than that. Mm. Um, it's not less. It's not a little bit less cynical. It's a lot less cynical. Mm. And they certainly weren't trying to like hijack the. White and David story. Selznick is a yeah, very admirable figure in many ways. He is, yeah. and and he was trying to get it right. He just didn't get it right. Right, but I mean he was trying to, mm. and so. Um, so yeah, so he of course was a um, was Jewish himself, and he was a first generation Jew. His mm. parents had immigrated from what is now Lithuania, and and one of the contexts in my book, it, and it's one of the things that people haven't talked about with Gone with the Wind that I thought was so important to bring back into the story, is the fact that it's always been it's always talked about as a book against the context of the Great Depression in mm. the 1930s, but not against the rise of fascism, mm. Mm. and that was another big thing that was happening in the 1930s. And in fact, when it emerged 
uh, it was it was understood within those debates, and I mm. show that in the book, that way in which it was actually talked about in relation to the rise of European fascism and the rise of American fascism. And perhaps fascism. we should explain, the, uh, uh, the book was published in 36 and the film that came out at, in the, 30, end, at the end of 39. 39. They finished yeah. filming uh, it, literally days before war was declared. So they finished mm. filming at the end of August uh, 1939. Right. And, um, and then the film came out in December 1939, mm. so during the Phony War, mm. and then it started making its way across the United States mm. and then into the rest of the world across 1940. Mm. So, um, so it, it was literally emerging in this context of the rise of fascism, and the point is, is that it was debated in those terms. Mm. So it's not just me saying, look, there was this backdrop, we should pay attention to that. It's that there were people reading it saying, this is making me think about fascism mm. in Europe, <laughs> right? I mean, and there were, so having these um, I mean, a, a these debated, uh, by whom are we talking? Are we talking the sort of general population or? Well, media? some. I mean, there were columnists who did it. Yeah. I mean, there were there were people for, who who it reminded of European fascism. Right. Yeah. Um, but there, but in particular, it was African Americans who who were who were making the argument at the same time that uh, that what America that what the United States was doing to African Americans was fascism by another name. Yeah. And they had been, and, and very prominent writers like Langston Hughes, yeah. um, uh, a, 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 a couple of terrific writers now less well remembered, but um, one called Joel Augustus uh, Rogers, who was a Jamaican American, terrific writer, really, really interesting. And, um, uh, um, and Schuyler, um, George Schuyler, who I also bring into the book, mm. who's a really, really interesting writer. Um, and so there were these very prominent African Americans who were standing up and saying, hello, mm. this looks a lot like fascism. Mm. Um, and, and they were, since the novel came out in 36, they were uh, um, fighting a, to stop it being filmed, and then if it was filmed, to stop it being as virulently racist as the novel was. Mm. And they said, you mentioned Birth of a Nation earlier, mm, mm. Um, and, and Birth of a Nation had unleashed racial violence and they were in 1915, and they were very worried 20 years later that the same thing might happen, mm. with good reason. Mm, mm. Um, and so it's important to understand that in 1936, when the novel came out, lynching was still happening in the United States. Mm. Public lynching was still happening in the southern states in the United States. And when I say public lynching, I mean that they would advertise the fact that they were going to torture a human being in 1936 under the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they would let you know days in advance that this was going to happen so you could buy a train ticket and you could go watch a human being be burned alive in 1936, okay? So when I say public lynching, I mean acts of atrocity and barbarism in 1936. And when Gone with the Wind came out, it was, as you mentioned earlier, it, 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 was, it, it, it has built into it this apologia for Klan racist violence. Mm. And the hero, Ashley, is the head of the Klan. He is the head of the Atlanta Klan. He's the hero, and he's the head of the Klan. Um, and people remember the scene from the film where um, it's an incredibly iconic scene where Scarlett makes a dress out of her mother's green velvet curtains. And she goes to visit Rhett in jail. But in my experience, people often forget or, or misremember why Rhett is in jail and think that he's there as a prisoner of war mm. of the Yankees. But he's not. He's there because he lynched a black man. And he says that. Um, in the novel, he's very straightforward about it. In the film, it's slightly euphemized, but mm. it's still... Mm. In fact, in the film, he says that the Yankees are just trumping up charges. Um, and he says anything will do. In the novel, he says, uh, it's true, I did lynch him. He was uppity, and he, and he uses the N-word to describe it, and he says... And, um, and, and uppity is a He very, was uppity to a lady. But, I mean, uppity is a very sort of loaded word. It sure it? is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Up, he was uppity to a lady. What else could a white Southern gentleman do? No, what else could a Southern gentleman do? Because, wow. of course, a Southern gentleman is white by definition. So Selznick is presented with this problem <coughs> of what to do with this, and he's very conscious, as, and he said this, he was very conscious as a Jewish, as a son of immigrants, that the comparisons between black racism in America, anti-black racism in America, and uh, anti-Jewish fascism in Europe, that the parallels were very strong. And, and he had this dilemma. Um, and uh, they ended up deciding that the way to do it was just to kind of whitewash everything. Mm. And as you said, so to take the Klan but turn it into a social club, because he didn't want references to the Klan to be um, inflammatory. Mm. But the problem was that then it just ends up making it seem like it's all okay, mm. you know, and like nothing very bad was happening. And so what they end up doing is is just um, a, a, a kind of watering it all down, mm. 
so that you end up watching this film thinking that it's all not really that bad. And um, it's a pleasant uh, fantasy of sort of black uh, people who actually enjoy living. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, living, so yeah. she uses this phrase, Mitchell uses this phrase throughout the book that I think really sums up the book's attitude, um, which is she, <laughs> this phrase, willing slave. She mm. keeps saying they were willing slaves. What is a willing slave? Mm. Like, then that's what, I mean, and, and uh, but uh, the same, I mean, again, we were talking earlier about, you know, what it was like growing up with this story, and, you know, even in the Reaganite 80s, um, people would talk about th this, oh, it's the story of the ideal slave plantation. Hmm. The what? Like, just stop, you know, and, and I, I mean, I remember uh, unthinkingly using that phrase, and people unthinkingly using that phrase, an ideal slave plantation. And I say in the book, and I absolutely believe this, and some people say it's a frivolous comparison, and I do not think it is, and I will go to my grave insisting that this is a legitimate comparison, that is like saying an ideal concentration camp. Mm. It is. Mm. What are you talking about? Mm. Mm. Um, what are you talking about to say it's a will sh this person is a willing slave? Mm. Mm. Um, and, and those kind of contortions that the story has to go through all of the time to try to square an impossible... Alternate circle. facts create an alternate universe. Yeah. And it's, it's, for me, it's one of the ways that, that you know, I'm trying to make sense of how we got where we are in American politics now. And one of the key ways for me is to understand that, is that people, when Trump came into power, so many people said, and I said it, like, how did he convince Americans of this alternate reality mm. so fast? Like, within a year, he had, a couple of months, he had Americans parroting whatever lie he chose to say. Mm. And then, you look back on all of this stuff and it's, my God, we've been living in an alternate reality for 160 years. This mm. is nothing new. And you've got a situation where you have a, you have a Jewish film director uh, making a film of a novel with a racist undertones, which uh, people are comparing at, at, at fascism. And, and, if it, he, and, and if he was in Europe still, he would be under the crotch of the Nazis. Exactly, so, and he so was very conscious sort of, of that. Yeah. He was very conscious of that. And so, as I say, he was trying to do the right thing. I mean, he sent memos saying things like he wanted to be sure that black people came out on the right side of the ledger in the film. Like, mm. he, 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 and he did, he did the, the thing, he, he want, the problem was that he was determined to be faithful to the novel, and the mm. novel is racist. And, and you can't be both. You can't be both, yeah. right? So what he, what he ended up doing was he, he would try to, um, he would do things like, uh, uh, he, so, we talked about Hattie McDaniel um, winning the Oscar. Um, and, and Mammy is, is a, a totally forgettable character on the page. She barely exists in the mm. novel. She has nothing like the stature mm. that Hattie McDaniel gives, her, gives the character. And so what did he do? He, he hired a really great actress. Mm. He gave her the scope to, mm. to play the part. But he also gave her a lot more screen time. He gave her actual time to, mm. to make Mammy a character. Mm. Um, and, Hattie, and, and Hattie McDaniel um, negotiated with him and, and, and um, encouraged Butterfly McQueen as well, who, was, who played Prissy, um, to, to lobby against using the N-word because he did want to use the N-word mm. because he was convinced that it wouldn't do any harm. Mm. He was convinced that it was just historical verisimilitude and that it would just lend accuracy. Mm. And all of the black people around him were telling him that that was wrong. Because... It would incite violence. Because the N-word is... It, yeah. Because it incites it's, violence. Yeah. And they said, if you use this word, we know, exp you, you, you have this theory about it. Mm. And we're telling you, experientially, mm. your theory is wrong. Well, that word happen. incites violence. Mm. Mm. So don't use it. Mm. Um, and Hattie McDaniel negotiated with him. And she, and, she and, um, and she got the rest of the black cast to, to kind of persuade him. Mm. Other people did as well. But, um, but she was quite active in that. And basically, it was a trade-off. And she said she'd play the part as written in this minstrel caricature. Mm. Um, as long as they didn't use that word. And Butterfly McQueen said she told them that she would do everything they wanted her to do, but she wouldn't eat watermelon. She wouldn't use that word, and she mm. wouldn't let them hit her. Mm. And there's an extraordinary uh, revelation in the book. You talk about the launch mm. a party of yeah. the... You think... I mean, I, you know what I'm... I, I certainly do, because it is an extraordinary story. And, and well, you should tell it. But. Well, people have credited me with finding it, and, and I should say I did not discover this story. I wish I had. But it, it is out there to the extent that I don't know who found it, right. or I would have credited them. Um, but it's not well-known enough, mm. and so that's why I included it um, in the book. So, yes, yeah, so the night before the launch, at the end of um, 1939... The launch was in Atlanta, um, <laughs> segregated at that point, um, of course. Uh, and um, the, so the night before, they did this pageant, this whole gala, and they invited all the Atlanta great and the good, which at that time, by definition, because it was segregated, were all white. Um, and they put on a show, and, and they had this um, backdrop on the stage that was you know, a painted plantation that was this idealized slave plantation. 
And then they had all the cast and the crew, and, and I say the Atlanta VIPs were all sitting there, and they brought out a choir of, um, of young um, uh, black boys from a local church to sing um, slave spirituals. And they dressed them up as slaves. They dressed them up as pickaninnies, um, in the word that they used. And, um, and they were there singing these slave spirituals, and it brought a tear to the eye of the actress who played Belle, the prostitute with a heart of gold. And, um, and the, the church choir was the, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, but it was the, so I won't try to do it because I don't want to mangle it. Um, but the, the pastor of the church, is, it's the church that um, Raphael Warnock is now the pastor of, who's the sitting senator from Georgia. It was, the, uh, the pastor was a man named Martin Luther King Sr. And one of the boys singing in the choir was Martin Luther King Jr. at 10 years old. And when you read about that, you think that's the kind of thing that might turn you into a civil rights activist. Mm, mm. He would have, I mean, he would have been under no illusions of what the film was. Yeah. yeah even at yeah. the age of 10. Of course. You know, and the s singing slave spirituals for the entertainment of a white crowd, mm. you know, so that they can munch peanuts and think about how nice it would have been if they too could own slaves. Mm, mm. I mean, you know, wouldn't yeah, it turn yeah. you into a civil rights activist? <laughs> I think it would. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we've got, I mean, just to sort of, we've we got about uh, 10 minutes left before we open it up to questions, but just to sort of, uh, just to sort of uh, 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 forward wind into the, into the present. Mm. And we've talked a lot about the, you know, the tensions in the, in, in the book and how it sort of knocks on to history. I mean, we're in a, you know, I, I mean, you said earlier that everyone asks you the question, you know, what the hell's going on with America? And what, you know, what the hell is going on with America? <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, America's got itself in this extraordinary situation now where, you know, sort of a Trump, I, I was in New York uh, two weeks ago mm. on, on, on the day, you know. Oh, were you? Yeah. The day of the indictment. The day of the indictment in Midtown was a completely clogged. Yeah. And there was a real sort of tension in yeah. the air. And we had this extraordinary situation where, you know, sort of, a, you know, sort of Trump has been, <laughs> has been hauled in. Yeah. And I mean, where does America go uh, uh, from here? I mean, we, you know, is it is it that now uh, America is always on the brink of you know you know someone even if it's not Trump you know you know some kind of Trump like a, a person who will who will you know who, who will try and uh, derail a democracy? I mean, what? Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. where does America go? Yeah, I think that's that's the, the answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't be facetious about uh, saying I was jealous that. Um, about him getting indicted, because it, I always let a joke get the better of me. But the, um, but the 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 reality is is that it's a it's a very sad. It, I think it's terrible state of affairs for my country that mm. that we're at a place where this had to happen. But it did have to happen, and therefore I am glad that it happened. Mm. Um, well, whichever way it goes, it's kind of a problem, isn't it? Yeah, if and there's no good outcome. No, there's no good outcome now. But that's, in my view, that's really been true from the moment that he got elected. Mm. Uh, that was very clear. That there were not going to be any good outcomes. Mm. Mm. Um, and that's just gotten truer and truer as, as the time uh, has passed. Um, look, I think that the, o the only way that I, can, that I can see, I think there are a couple of things that need to happen. Um, one is it, it is going to be interesting to see what kinds of legal limits uh, Fox and other um, participants in this um, breakdown of democracy, what kinds of penalties they start to face. Um, I'm thinking of Alex Jones mm -hmm. and um, the way that, that his loss in that civil lawsuit may, uh, seems to be unraveling his um, empire. Um, the fact that Trump is not only um, being indicted for, uh, you know, um, uh, obviously these, these uh, financial crimes which have now been linked with campaign crimes, um, by um, by Alvin Bragg, but also he started the civil case um, that E. Jean Carroll has brought against him for rape. Um, the in some ways, because the bar is lower for civil cases, in some ways, the civil cases will can can be more can hold powerful people to account better in the U.S. Mm. than criminal cases might be able to, because the threshold for evidence is so very high. Mm. Um, I mean, it was interesting to see in this um, in this terrible case. I'm going to blank on his name, but of, we'll, everybody will know it. The, the the black boy who just got shot on the doorstep by, for ringing the Ralph. wrong doorbell. Yes. Um, um, yeah. Um, yes. Um, I saw the picture of him holding a bass <sighs> a clarinet. Yeah. 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 And the but the man who shot him has been. Um, they've they they haven't brought attempted homicide against him. They've brought assault with a deadly weapon. Mm. 
And I was horrified when I first read that. I was like, oh my god, you know, typical, same mm. stuff keeps mm. happening. But then I was reading some legal commentary about it, and, and the lawyers were saying that actually there's, because the guy's quite old, um, who, did, who shot this poor child, who apparently is going to survive, which mm. is the good news. Um, and, um, and that they were saying that they probably, the, the state probably brought assault with a deadly weapon because it's easier to prove right. than attempted homicide with mens rea, but it still brings a, uh, a sentence of 25 to life, mm. and he's old, so they figure they'll get the same outcome, but they've got a lower threshold, right? Mm. So we're seeing that with a lot of these civil cases, and it's going to be interesting to see basically how the capillary action of the law maybe can start to... Um, to, to, to hold people to account. I think that, you know, I, I look at somebody like George Santos, for example. And look, there, some, again, these are just reports, nobody knows for sure, but I, um, I read a report and I thought it was really convincing. Somebody said, well, you know, he told somebody, so this is all unconfirmed, but it's a persuasive account, um, that he said, well, you know, if you serve a full term in Congress, you get pension and medical insurance for life. That's all you need. That's You're set up for you life. Set up to go. Set for life. That's all you need. And um, and I'd never thought about it before. And I was like, oh. So to your point about you know, has it shown con artists and criminals yeah. how they can just get a foot into government? Absolutely, it has. But is it, but the trouble is, even if Trump uh, uh, goes, you know, even if he goes down, if he keeled over tomorrow, the th what he's actually un uh, unleashed is a very difficult to, uh, to claw back. And this idea that yeah, you can't put the you, genie back in the bottle. No, you can believe what the hell you want about anything. I mean, this yeah. is I mean, this is the sort of this is the toxicity the toxicity of his. It is, but I think there are a couple of, I mean, well, one... How do you deal with that? Well, I don't know, but w one thing is that, you know, I think that we have to, to take a couple of views on it. First of all, it wasn't Trump really who unleashed it, in my view. It was George W. Bush and mm. Karl Rove and their discussions of the fact that the, um, the Karl Rove line about the reality-based community and how you didn't have to listen to the reality-based mm. community, mm. which is implicitly in, in conflict with the faith-based community. But then Trump sort of brought that into the mainstream, perhaps. Well, I mean, George W. Bush was pretty mainstream. Mm. I mean, he was president too, you know. But um, but that's my point is that but it was unleashed after, then. But after Bush, though, you know, we, we managed to have Obama, so yeah. So and then you have a massive backlash yeah. against it with Trump, right? So I think for me, the the the, the one of the real problems is about the ways that um, a very large democracy can incorporate a very large evangelical community mm. that believes some things that are quite that are very much in tension with an evidence-based secular scientific understanding mm. of the world. Mm. Um, and that's not about Trump. Trump just weaponized that. Mm. Um, and, um, and in many ways, Trump was their weapon rather than the other way around, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, uh, useful idiot. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. Um, uh, certainly that was true for McConnell. McConnell's goal was to get right-wing judges on the court, and mm. Trump helped him do that, and that's what he wanted mm. to do, and he didn't give a damn about Trump. Still doesn't to this day. He got what he wanted. Mm. Um, and the right-wing Supreme Court justices are getting exactly what they want. Mm. So, um, look, it's a, it, so there's a, there's, a, there's a deep poison in the well of American democracy, there's no question. And, um, and it's, we, were, we were talking in the green room about the ways in which you know, capitalism and democracy are increasingly coming into direct mm. conflict. And I don't pretend to know what the answer to that is. Uh, I think that in, in terms of the ways in which we can try to think about coming back together as a society. It seems to me that, and, and you know, one of the reasons for writing a book like this is that um, somebody asked me at one of these talks, do, do I believe that truth will set you free? And I don't believe that truth <laughs> will set you free because there's a lot of truth around us and, mm. and um, freedom is, is a ways away. But, um, but I do believe that truth is a precondition of freedom. Mm. I don't think we can have freedom without truth. Mm. Mm. And I also think it's a precondition of reconciliation. Mm. I don't think that we can come across over our divides unless we have some understand, some shared sense of, and truths can be plural, they have to, almost certainly have to be mm. multiple, there will not be a single monolithic truth. Mm. Um, but we have to recognize that the stories that were once adequate for, uh, uh, um, for the United States, and, it, and I, I would dare to say the same might be said of Britain as well, these kinds of ostensibly unifying national narratives that actually excluded so many people, mm. Mm. Um, and that some people remain wedded to because they worked for them. Mm. They unified, they, they gave them a national identity that they could understand, and, and it didn't matter to them that so many people were excluded. But if you, if you can create a national story that actually does 
include most everybody, if not literally everybody, that will have to have multiple truths in it. It will have to be more flexible and elastic. It will have to recognize it can't have this childish version of history in which we're all the good guys and other people are all the bad guys. We have a more mature version of it in which people did bad things, but we have a, a story about yeah. looking all of that in the eye. It's like a truth and reconciliation sort of. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that as a process, yeah. if I'm honest, but I, I just think it's, I don't know that it needs to be that systematic, but, yeah. that, but the, yes, I think you have to, I do think you have to, you have to reckon with it, mm. and that's really what my book is about. I mean, that's where the title comes from. That's what The Wrath to Come is about, is about a reckoning. And, um, and James so Baldwin, isn't it? It is Baldwin, yeah. yeah. And I think that there is a reckoning at hand, and, um, and, and I do think that you could reconcile if you could create a story capacious enough. Mm. And that is not beyond the wit of man. It's, mm. just that, it's just that there's not a lot of willingness right now to do that. Mm. And because, because, because Trump has, has, has made it so toxic, it's very difficult for any other narrative to... Well, as I say, I see him as symptomatic rather mm. than a cause. Um, but he's a he's a really, yeah, he's a big ugly symptom. Mm. He's like a big boil, yeah, mm. uh, that definitely needs to be lanced. Mm. Um, but um, but y y I mean, another way I talk about this in the book is that I think that because yes, a couple of people said to me like at various points like, are you saying that Gone with the Wind caused Donald Trump? I'm like, well, obviously I'm not saying <laughs> Gone with the Wind caused Donald Trump. I mean, um, but what I'm saying is that they both grew on the same family tree. And they have very strong family resemblances as a result of that. Do you think, uh, sorry, we'll open up, up, up to oh. questions in just uh, one minute, but just one uh, final thought. I mean, how aware do you think Trump is of all this sort of history of a civil war? I mean, when he, you know, when he, you know, you know when he, you know, books are gone with the wind, I mean, how much is he conscious of what it actually stands for? Or oh, whether it's just. Very little. You know, you know. <laughs> no, no, I think, so look, I, I, I mean, I think he is a man of. Thundering ignorance, mm. right? I mean, just absolutely. I mean, really, he is. He isn't burdened by nuance. No, he's not, yeah. or by fact. Yeah. But, um, but that is, but that is not to underestimate him either. Mm. He is, he is clearly extremely intelligent mm. um, and shrewd as hell. Mm. Um, Scheming. Ske I mean, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I, it's not to say I underestimate him as an opponent, mm. but 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 the gathering of knowledge and wisdom and historical fact was obviously not high on his list of mm. priorities. No, mm. um, he was accumulating other things, but mm. that wasn't uh, that wasn't, that wasn't among them. Mm. Um, so no, I don't think he knows a damn thing about the civil war, but he doesn't care. It didn't it doesn't get him where he needs to be. Mm. Mm. He's not a student. So of, he's yeah. not a student of history. No, no, no. Um, he's a stu he's a student of human moods, as, <laughs> I, as I think some people might say. Shall we open up to questions, please? Um, yeah, in the white jumper. Oh, sorry. Polly, how long do we have ever questions? <laughs> I feel we just got started now. Uh -uh. Hi, um, small story, big question. I was on a tour of the Capitol in DC in November, pretty much as soon as it reopened again, thanks to COVID and a small matter of an insurrection. Mm. Um, and the tour guide who was showing us around said at one point, I'm not meant to talk about January the 6th, but if you look over there, that's Officer Eugene Goodman, the one who famously led them away from the Senate chamber. And that really sat with me that I thought, why aren't we talking about it? Because this republic, if you happen to keep it, the person who does your job in 100 years will absolutely talk about what happened that day in the same way that we talk about the Civil War now. It, mm -hmm. it happened. You've got witnesses to that event still working in here. And before we've even seen justice, and I mean real justice for the lawmakers, the legislators, the, the president, for their part in that, I don't count the QAnon shaman sitting in prison as justice, frankly. Mm. We're already, shh, don't talk about it. Mm. And I thought, is that why from the Civil War and the Great Lie and glamorizing it in Gone with the Wind through to Wilmington mm -hmm. in 1898 in the insurrection there, which Insurrection, the first time I heard that was January the 6th. Mm. Didn't know there was one in Wilmington. 1921, Tulsa race riots, mm -hmm. literally burning down like journalists' offices, mm -hmm. newsrooms, so that people didn't know about it. Then civil rights, just count the whole 60s, Emmett Till. Are we due a flare up in America every couple of decades because I say we, like I'm an American, but we as a human race aren't talking about it. When you compare it to somewhere like Germany, who are so engaged with their most horrendous and embarrassing acts that they haven't had something happen again. But in America, as a collective, it's 
don't talk about it. Don't mm. don't embarrass the people that did it mm. and putting it under the carpet and moving mm. on. So yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, and I'm really glad that you framed it in that way. It's actually how I opened the book. Um, and uh, I literally open it with the instruction, and, um, and with saying that um, I absolutely believe that what you implied um, in your question is the case, that, um, that this process of, of, as you say, sweeping things under the carpet began with the Civil War. And it's, and it's something that I, that, in fact, it didn't even begin with Civil War. It really began with the American Revolution. Um, because that was a civil war, right? That was a war of brother against brother and father against daughter. And, um, and we didn't talk about that as a civil war, but it was a civil war. And um, so I think that the United States has always been riven by civil war. Um, uh, and as you, as you uh, suggest, um, over time that became more and more magnetized around the question of race for various reasons. Um, the, but it's it's not the only thing that divides America and that makes that kind of violence flare up, but it is a, uh, it, it's a kind of prime mover all of the time. Um, so, um, and, and I, but particularly after the Civil War, the problem was, you know, the thing about Germany is, you use the example, so Germany was a defeated nation that had to look within. Um, you can have uh, uh, another version where, you know, how does Britain understand its role in the war, right? But that it had defeated, in its view, it had defeated an external nation. The problem with civil wars, what do you do to bring the country back together again? You've got the defeated nation within and you want them to be part of the country. And in particular, in this case, you have, you, the civil war was over the fact that half of the country wanted to leave the country and you force them to remain, which is an unusual version of civil war even in that, you know, is to say, no, we're going to keep you whether you like it or not. Well, they didn't like it, and like it one little bit. So you have this forced unification. And, and then the, the question is, how do you create a semblance of unity? And then Lincoln was assassinated. And, and, and in my view, that was an absolute, there's a question what a turning point that was in the moral history of the United States. Um, and th for all kinds of reasons. Um, but basically, the United States had a choice about whether it was going to move toward justice or whether it was going to move toward unity. And it chose unity, uh, uh, the semblance of unity over the reality of justice. And it's still trying to do that. And it did exactly the same thing with the insurrection, as you say. And so the, the problem is, is that you can't, you can't demand the kind of scrutiny that Germany was forced to give itself as a defeated nation from incorporating part of this country and then saying, no, no, we're all back in this together. So now, so what happened in the United States, and I go, this is really what the book is about, I go into great length uh, about this in the book, is that what the United States did was, was reunify over white supremacy. White people came together and said, well, we're the United States, black people are free, so they've got what they need, and we wash our hands of them, and then they reunited over these stories that romanticized the South, which is why the North became invested in that, because it saved face for everybody. And, and then black people were literally the collateral damage of that. And, it, and it, what it did was shore up and sustain white power. So that was fine. Yeah. Uh. Firstly, thank you. That's been really interesting this evening. And just a couple of observations I wanted to make and then ask you what you thought of them. Firstly, one of the things that massively worries me about America is people talk about Trump and how horrific he is, but people like George, H. Bush, um, George Herbert Bush, um, Reagan, who's widely revered, Nixon, all used massive racial dog whistles and got away with it. And I mean, even Clinton arguably did a lot of racial dog whistles. So that really worries me in terms of how people remember them and how people, uh, people see them. So, there's, so there is that, and I think Trump is part of that long tradition of being able to do that, and it works. And, it, and, and that's obvious that that has worked for significant numbers of politicians in America. The second thing is, how much is Trump a failure of the Democratic Party to actually build coalitions based around economic justice, so, for example, you know, white working class people, significant numbers of whom voted for Trump, not all, but significant numbers, and African Americans based around economic, economic justice has led to people like Trump. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so a couple of uh, complicated questions. Um, so briefly, what I would say is that y y um, it's very difficult to separate, partly for the reasons I was talking about earlier around the, the history of segregation and, and what happened to black people after um, emancipation. It's very difficult to separate racism and, and um, economic equality in America. They're very, very intertwined. Um, as they are in many other parts of the world, but it's it, it's really really salient um, in the U.S. Um, the the degree to which racism, um, as as you say, as a dog whistle, is works successfully, uh, you know, politically to to rally certain portions of the electorate is just is just a fact in American life and. Uh, I don't say that to throw up my hands about it, but it's just to say that it's observable in the ways that you describe. And, um, and the, the obvious remedies for that are you know, education and, um, and the kinds of reconciliation that we're talking about and trying to find ways to bring people together um, and, and to not stoke division and you know, all of that kind of obvious stuff. Um, the, um, the, the question of whether Trump is, it represents a failure of the Democrats, well, <coughs> No, Trump represents a failure of the Republicans, um, and, I, and I feel very strongly about that. Um, they had every opportunity to stand up and to say, this shall not pass, and they still let it pass. Um, but that is not to say that Democrats have not failed in important ways. I just will not blame them for Trump. The, the Republicans need to own Trump. Um, but certainly the Democrats have, uh, have had, we could, name chapter and verse of all kinds of things we'd all like, I'm sure, to be seeing them do differently. For me, the, the fundamental problem with the way the Democrats are working right now is, well, there are two for me. We can talk about it in terms of economic justice, um, and, and clearly we all believe in that, and I've been talking about that you know, implicitly, I hope is clear through, the, um, through this discussion. But um, I think the two ways in which electorally the Democrats are, are not working very well right now is, is um, and boy, we're seeing it with Feinstein at this very moment, um, is that um, it's a gerontocracy and they're not creating any kind of succession which would lead to some of the conversations around economic justice that you would like them to be having. It's, so for me, it's a generational thing that would enable those conversations. If they, the, the, the Republicans, however much I, I may loathe this current iteration of Republicans, and I should say I don't hate Republicans like on principle. I come from a family of Republicans, but none of them support these people, and I think these people, I, I do loathe these particular, this particular iteration of Republicans. Um, but the one thing I have to give them is that, they, is that they are bringing their young radical wing in, and they recognize that they win votes, and that Lauren Biebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I deplore, are winning votes. And it is remarkable to me that the Democrats are refusing to do that with AOC and they're trying to fight people like AOC instead of bringing her in. And she would lead to those conversations around economic justice because that's what she's gonna frickin' talk about. Um, so the, so there's, there's that and then there's the fact that as somebody once put it, um, I think brilliantly, um, the, the, I think it was a Republican operative, but I can't remember which one, um, the, um, the Democrats, uh, the Democrats keep bringing pillows to a knife fight, and um, and <laughs> and that's right. Um, it's absolutely right. And the the Republicans are, are they've been playing dirty my whole life, and um, and the Democrats keep playing nice. But it's a problem because you don't want to sink to their level. It's also that thing about you know the great Lyndon Johnson line about you know um, don't don't whatever it is about don't get into don't get into a fight with a pig because you know you'll get muddy and the pig will love it. Um, you know, and and you just end up. You just end up as, as low as they are. Um, so it's a, it's a real problem about how do, you, how do you fight. And they know that. And they know that. Yeah. How do you fight um, people who don't have scruples without losing your own scruples? But um, I do think that the Democrats need to be more ruthless. As I said, the Feinstein thing right now, some of you will be following this story, but you know, Feinstein is very, very old. And she's a California senator. She's 89. She hasn't shown up um, for weeks now, um, she's, she's being covered for by staffers. It's very clear that she can't do the job and the Democrats won't replace her and she needs to be replaced. She can't do the job. Um, and it means that we're losing votes. We can't get judges into seats it, in Biden's last year and a half, which we absolutely have to do to try to counter all the stuff that McConnell did. And the Democrats are going, oh, well, we can't be mean to Feinstein. Well, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. And we're, you know, 
I respect the woman, but put her, put her to one side, say thank you for everything you've done, and we need to get judges. Time to kick back and what we got We gotta get judges on the bench. Mm. Off you go. Yeah. There was a, oh, that, sorry. sorry, there was, a, there was a, a man back there, I think, first, and then. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's had his hand up for a while. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Thank, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to say, um, f first thing is about when um, Lincoln was assassinated, was that Andrew Johnson, I mean, he was hated beyond, beyond the pale. Uh, and it's, I think we have to be clear about the, the words we use here, because Lincoln talked about, you know, reconstruction. When Johnson came in, <laughs> I mean, this man was going to be impeached. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, he vote. talked about... Yeah, one boat, yeah, mm. <laughs> important one. Mm. <laughs> he talked about restructuring. Mm. That's an important distinction we have to be very clear about. And when you talk about sweeping things underneath the carpet, <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're a black man in the South and you cannot recite, you know, the, the First Amendment, you're in trouble, you yeah. can't vote. Yeah. You know, those are the things they put <coughs> in deliberately in your way that mm. a white person, yeah. a white man, wouldn't get. Yeah, absolutely. And there's all kinds of shenanigans like that that's not talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up. And it's again, it's something I go into in, in, uh, um, in detail in the book because it's incredibly important, the history of voter suppression in America and how it comes out of, of that electoral, out of giving black men the vote. Yeah, and and the thing about Andrew Johnson, as you say, I mean, so when I said earlier that the that the uh, assassination of Lincoln was a crossroads in America, that's what I was referring to. It's a long story about what happened with Johnson, as you know, but for those who who, who don't, just very briefly, so Johnson, um, who was Lincoln's vice president, became president when Lincoln was assassinated by, uh, you know, by act of law, um, and he was a um, he was a, a white. Um, he, he was, a, 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 he was a, a white Southerner who Lincoln had included on his ticket to try to get the white Southern Democrat vote that he needed, um, and the, or the split off vote. I mean, they were Republicans, but you know, the, the, the split vote there. And, um, and that he, um, but the thing about Johnson was that he, he represented a, a, a particular stratum that we've lost sight of which you see, a, saw a lot in Reconstruction and it, it comes up in, in Gone with the Wind and it's in context as well, which is that there, it, it, Johnson was opposed to slavery, but he was a white supremacist. And the reason that he was opposed to slavery was because he was a poor white and he was opposed to slavery because of the economic inequality that created for poor whites. So he, didn't give a damn about black people's rights. That wasn't why he was opposed to slavery. So he thought that slavery should be abolished, but white people should be in charge. And so when he became president, he instituted sweeping pardons. He forgave everybody in the South for the insurrection. Um, and he gave them back their land. He gave them back everything. They got everything given back to them except their human property. And all of the status quo was restored. Um, and that's how that, that reunification that I was talking about was enabled, as you know, but for those um, in, the, in the room who didn't know. And the consequences of that are absolutely enormous. And, and for a lot of people, that is the single thing that makes him the worst US president in history, without doubt. And it means that he still beats Trump to that dubious honor. Without a doubt. Yeah. The ramifications of him will yeah. be lived with us still now. Absolutely. And then when I talk about Trump, Trump yeah. Democracies throw out people like Trump. Yeah. You, let's face it. Let's not get away from that. Absolutely. There's no messing about that. Yeah. Back to the Romans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you go to democracy. Every now and again, they will throw up somebody yeah. like that. We've had plenty of bad presidents. We've plenty. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's you know we we have to understand that. Yeah. You know, in Thank a pluralist you. society. Yeah. And the way we have to learn to to try to mend that together. Yeah. That's something that America has to do. Look within. I agree. Thank you very much. Seriously examine themselves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We've probably got time for there was one the more, two more if we break it. Sorry? Okay. Well, there okay, was the lady minutes. in the front there. Yep. Three more questions. Oh, three more questions. <laughs> okay. Three more questions. I do three minutes. Three. Okay. Three. <laughs> so this, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Thank you. Um, as a um, young girl, I I loved watching Gone with the Wind, the film, mm. because of the strong female characters, and mm. they really resonated me, with me as a, as a young person, and I've always remembered the film because of those characters, even Melly. Mm. 
um, who you might think is the traditional female, but actually I think she's very strong. Mm. And I just wondered how, in terms of feminism, at the time of the <coughs> film and how that was portrayed, any mm. impact that that had in 1939-40 and women's rights at that time, what impact the, the film had on, on feminism slash women's rights? Mm. It's a really good question. I would say that it was sort of the other way around, which is that the, um, the I don't know how, um, how many other American films from the 30s that you've seen, but it was an era of very strong women on film, right? So it's the era of Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and Katharine Hepburn. And, um, so, and of course it was Vivian Lee's um, first, I mean, she played, she was in Fire Over England with, um, with Olivia, but it was her first breakout role, right? And her first big starring role. Um, so if anything, I would say that those women had paved the way for a screen culture where a strong woman could kind of come into her own. And um, so there, uh, there had been, uh, it, it was really a, a kind of golden era, in my view, of, um, of women on film. We've never seen anything like it again. Certainly no parts written for women like that anymore. And I have a whole other thing that we could talk about, about you know, women of a certain age who are all, who are all pretending to be teenagers on film, whereas you know, B Betty Davis and Joan Crawford were in their 30s, and Barbara, Barbara Stanwyck, you know, these are women who never, ever would think of giggling, right? I mean, Barbara Stanwyck never giggled in her <laughs> effing life, right? And then, and then, I mean, I love Meryl Streep, but she giggles across all of her roles. I'm like, come on, like, have some, you know? I mean, anyway. So, uh, but so, so, Viv so I think that Vivian Lee, Vivian Lee benefited from that, that sense that, uh, that reality, that um, what was called a woman's picture uh, could open box office, as we would say today, and that these women stars were driving audiences. And of course, women were going to the cinema, and so they were identifying with them, and there was a very clear sense that this was a money-making proposition. Um, so I don't have any evidence that Scarlett O'Hara as a character or Vivian Lee's performance of Scarlett O'Hara necessarily advanced feminism in any uh, um, very explicit or direct ways. She, she as a character, was certainly um, received as part of that conversation around modern strong women. Yeah. And you know, she's certainly characterized in the film as a modern strong woman. I mean, there's that bit where she's packing a pistol, and Clark Gable even says, "Like, what a woman," you know, or something like that. And it's such a '30s, you know, kind of compliment. <laughs> is, you know. Um, and so I think that the, she, takes, she takes her place in that cavalcade of incredibly strong women who changed a conversation <coughs> about, uh, about role models and ideas around femininity, definitely, and in some ways is the culmination of that. But I don't, I don't see her as necessarily having caused any changes that I'm aware of, although I would be very interested to see anybody show me instances where that happened, and, I, and I, I, it certainly could have. Um, and, and it would be great to see. I do think she's a fabulous character. Um, it's just a shame about the story. <laughs> you know, but she is, she's an amazing character. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just going to ask a little bit about the film's, well, about... Uh, British attitude to the Civil War, um, mm. and and then the reception of the film mm. um, later on. Mm. Um, firstly, I was just going to mention that obviously uh, in the late nineteenth century, we have um, Uncle Tom's Cabin was perhaps the most popular book, mm. uh, well, one of the first bestsellers, mm. and also um, <coughs> working here, I've catalogued a lot of. Um, plays mm -hmm. that mention the Civil War from, mm -hmm. I mean, as early as they're, they're sort of quite into themes of the KKK, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the sort of the first iteration of the KKK mm -hmm. being represented in Britain in the 1870s. Yeah. So I'm um, so just going to ask what you thought about how the British fetishized the Civil War um, from the Victorian times onwards, yeah. and later how uh, the film was received in Britain in particular <laughs> in relation to that legislation, but also in light that they were currently fighting the Nazis. So yeah. you've got this strange yeah. combination of uh, attitudes going on. It is strange. And um, thank you for that question, which is really, and again, it's something I go into in the book because I'm really interested in that too, obviously as an American living here and that cross-cultural. Um, and one of the things that, that 
that I'm interested in is actually taking it back even a step further and looking at how the clan actually derives from some of the um, the a, a kind of degraded and, and vulgarized versions of Walter Scott. So Walter Scott leads to some of the imagery, the, the basic medievalism, but also really Ivanhoe, which is completely fetishized in the early 19th century in the South, actually give, and, and the Lady of the Lake, gives the image of the clan and the, and the, clan, uh, and the clan burning a, a fiery cross comes directly from Walter Scott. Um, and of course, Hail to the Chief, the song of the American president, comes directly from Walter Scott. In fact, it comes from a stage adaptation of The Lady of the Lake. So there's this iteration of popular culture from story to stage to film and back again um, that's happening all the way through this. So then, as you say, then there is after the, the so the Klan gets its, its imagery and its language from Walter Scott. Uh, as you say, the first version of the Klan was in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, so it starts in 1866 was abolished in 1871 by the federal government by the 1870s, partly because of the outlandish name, um, but because it had also made the news. Uh, it, it had definitely traveled, and there are, there are as you know, there are um, British London reports in the London Gazette. There are stories about this thing, the Klan. Um, Conan Doyle picked it up, and it's in one of his earliest stories. I'm blanking on the name. It's in the book. I can't remember which one it is, but it's in one of his earliest stories. Um, the Klan are the bad guys in Conan Doyle, but more because they're like culty than about the race as such, but because they're this esoteric, like the way that he goes after um, Mormons in one of the other early stories, right? So there are these weird American things. There's Mormons and there's the Klan. And, um, and, um, but he can see that they're like the bad guys. Um, and, but then in America, it starts to get rehabilitated. And it start, so the, the Klan starts to get rehabilitated at the same time. It's very weird. Um, but at the same time, Uncle Tom's Cabin, as you say, is so Uncle Tom's Cabin is published in 1851. Um, and uh, the most popular novel ever until it was surpassed by Gone with the Wind, which is its polar opposite politically and racially. But it was also um, becomes this incredibly successful stage adaptation at the same time that Thomas Dixon's novels about the Klan were becoming incredibly successful stage adaptations. So you have these two stories that are really diametrically opposed, and they're incredibly popular at the same time. And so you could really, you know, you, audiences could literally go from of, from seeing Uncle Tom's Cabin one night, which is anti-slavery, to seeing the Klansmen the next night, which is white supremacist and says that black people should never have been emancipated. And and nobody would like reconcile that cognitive dissonance. And then both of those things make their way into popular culture. And then those Klansman stories become the basis of Birth of a Nation in 1915. Um, and all of that stuff starts to export over here. The end game of it all, as far as I'm concerned, is like the black and white minstrel show, right? And is how that stuff makes its way over here. And that, and that history, that, that it gets deracinated, and I use that word advisedly, um, from its uh, original context and what does that look like when it comes so from Scott all the way to the black and white minstrel show and where do you end up and th that's why they're called minstrels right it's from Scott um, because again it's that medievalist imagery is that we would call it a minstrel um, so you kind of come full circle there um, as for how Gone with the Wind was uh, received in um, Britain everybody loved it um, because here's the thing is People didn't at the time, particularly. It, it was a huge hit in underground France, uh, in resistance France. Um, it was also a huge hit in Nazi Germany, which the Nazis deplored because it was American kitsch. Some of them, but some of them liked the fact that it was a big hit because it was because it was on the right side of racial history, right? The thing about Gone with the Wind is that depending on how you look at it, it does have kind of something for everybody. But it lets you identify with this idea that you're the victim, and that you're the survivor. And, and then you can kind of erase the politics. So it's a book in which Abraham Lincoln is the bad guy. And so you would think that you would stop and think about the politics of that in the Second World War, maybe for just a second, but nobody did. And so it's just about surviving an occupying army or, or surviving war. And so everybody would identify emotionally with that and then not stop and think about the way that the politics don't play out. And actually, this is a story that is sympathizing with the Nazis. And it is. One more. Me. Yeah. The lady there? Yes. Yeah. Hey, um, my mum gave me a copy of Gone with the Wind the Christmas I was 13, and I missed my dinner because I was so riveted mm. by it. And I'm quite staggered now 
to think all the things I missed, which speaks to what you were just, just saying, Sarah. But um, I have a 13-year-old daughter now, and it didn't occur to me <laughs> to give her this book for Christmas, partly because of the, I think, rich YA fiction that we have access mm. to now. But also, I'm wondering now whether I should give it to her, because I think the lens with which she would read it would be fascinating. Mm. And I just wanted to ask you... Uh, whether you think that would be a, a, a good thing to do and also, more generally, what you think the future of the book is mm. moving forward. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I mean, I, um, it's, a, it's a book that uses the N-word over 100 times in unproblematic ways. So um, the, the film, I, I haven't asked, I haven't taught the book now for a little while. Um, I've taught the film more recently. And the film, um, <coughs> it, uh, young people, are, in my experience anyway, this is obviously anecdotal, um, but are just kind of bewildered and, and put off by it and, and are not moved by it and are not, don't find Scarlet particularly identifiable, relatable, um, and, and just find the racial politics so repellent that they, don't, that they can't get beyond that and don't wish to get beyond that and are just find it rebarbative. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's, if what kind of benefit there is to that. It still can be an important some you know way to confront history and to think through those issues, um, but uh, you know uh, it, the the follow up to that is is as you rightly say is the question then about what is its future, um, and 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 I'm really glad you framed the question that way because often people ask me if I want to censor the book or do I think that it needs to be cancelled or any of that kind of thing and I'm a as I always say I'm a professor of literature so I'm not in the business of cancelling books, um, but also. You know, it's one of the most popular books ever written, as we've just said. So that ship has sailed. I could try to cancel it, but I'm not going to succeed. Um, but I don't want to. And I think that I think that all works of art have to stand or uh, or fall on. I mean, relevance is too narrow a word, but it, it, it as a shorthand on on whether they continue to speak to new audiences. That's what they have to do. People have to find something in them that they respond to. Um, I, I think that. Um, I, I, it would surprise me if the next generation uh, right now of young readers in English found that Gone with the Wind was the text they wanted to return to and that they were finding um, worth spending a thousand pages on. Um, but I don't think it's going to disappear, and I don't think that it should disappear. I think that it's... For me, it takes the place of um, this. Uh, it's the same way that I don't. I don't agree with the decision to change the language of Roald Dahl, and I don't agree with the decision to add sensitivity language into Gone with the Wind. I have, as I said, I have no problem with annotating around it, um, but I don't believe that you should alter the thing itself. And it has, to, as I say, it has to stand or 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 uh, fail on its own merits or lack thereof. Um, but it's, to me, it's, it's a bigger point, which goes back to the Selznick thing about whitewashing, is that if we eliminate it, then we just pretend it never happened. And we can't do that either. So, you know, the same way I don't believe that, a, that, that Huck Finn should replace the N-word with the word slave because it makes it sound like white Southerners were polite to black people, um, I don't think we should say that Gone with the Wind didn't happen because Gone with the Wind did happen, and it helps explain a lot about where we are. Um, but that doesn't mean that 13-year-olds necessarily will enjoy reading it. Um, but... I, I, if, if you do give it to her, I would very much be interested in what she thought of it. And you can recommend another book that she could read, perhaps. I, well, I could. Yours. That's true. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, mine's, mine has mine has some has some pretty brutal stuff in it for thirteen year olds. Uh, but um, no, I was gonna say like I would I would recommend that she read some Baldwin. Um, there's a wonderful book by Anne Petrie that nobody knows called The Street, which is really really interesting, which is about um, women. Uh, the the um, Anyway, it's that's that's and and the other one, if she hasn't read it, is um, Zora Neale Hurston's "Their Eyes Were Watching God." Yeah, that one. Yeah, go with those instead of instead of Mitchell. Thank you. I think we have to have to leave it there. And you're going to sign some books outside of it. Sign some books. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.